food. By show of hands, how many of you have eaten something today? I'm, I'm glad we all ate something. Well, um, the Earth's population is growing. The rate at which we are going, the Food and Agriculture Organization have some interesting projections. But in just two and a half decades, by 2050, we are 10 billion people. Another interesting statistic they have is that we will need to increase our crop production by 70%. Now, crop production becomes my interest because it sits right at the base of the food pyramid. Without crops, no food is made sufficiently going up. So the, the question is, will we have food to eat when we wake up in 2050? There is two paths we, we can take to, to make sure we, we have some food to eat by 2050. The one path is one that is being taken today by 80 to 90 percent of our farmers, a conventional means of agriculture. I will not touch so much on that today, but let me propose another path. Another path is to increase productivity in the same uh, uh, open land that we have today. But before I dive into, the, uh, in, into more details about this second path, let me tell you the current state of agriculture. Agriculture today, 80 to 90 percent is produced using conventional methods. What we've done with industrial revolution is that we've gotten the plow that was discovered in the fourth century, and we have hooked it onto so many horsepower of tractor, and the plow doesn't know to go to prepare the land in the place where we want to, where we initially seeded with sticks. The plow goes to open land everywhere, and what that is doing is that we have, one, destroyed the homes of the microorganisms in the soil, the very organisms that when we are done with our eight-hour shift every day, continue to work to make sure the plants are supplied with nutrition and to make sure that we have the yield that we want at the end of the season. What the plow has done is that when it has exposed the earth to oxygen, there is quicker decomposition of what must be uh, uh, covering the soil, and there is lots of emission of carbon dioxide, one of the major reasons for climate change. Statistics show that agriculture is currently contributing anything between 20 to 29 percent to climate change. The rate we are going, we certainly will hit a dead end. At the rate we are going, 2050, we may wake up and we may not have eaten. So can we now dive into my second option? The second option is climate smart agriculture interventions that have been practiced by about 10 to 20 percent. Some stats show 16 and a half percent of people, uh, of farmers in the world that are practicing climate smart agriculture. And to, to get into that, I have two classic examples in Zambia. One, a lady farmer by the name of Agnes Ndililwa. I met Agnes Ndililwa in 2009 when she farmed a maize crop that, that went 11 metric tons per hectare. Yeah, to put that into context, 11 metric tons per hectare is five times today's national maize average yield in Zambia. It is five times. Agnes, today, 10 years later, has moved from her one hectare plot that she farmed then, and she farms far further north into a district called Masaiti, where she farms 20 hectares of maize in rotation with legume crops using conservation agriculture methods. When I talked to her uh, a few weeks ago, Agnes was telling me she is averaging anything between seven to eight metric tons per hectare. And some more context to that, if every smallholder farmer in Zambia adopted Agnes' way of farming, the climate-smart way of farming, we will produce enough maize 
to feed the whole of Zambia, and it will be sufficient for up to four of our neighboring countries, the southern direction. I think Agnes has got a solution for us to wake up to in 2050 and have food to go around. Another classic example is a large-scale farmer. His name is Peter Harrow. Peter Harrow farms in Mkushi district of the central province of Zambia. Peter Harrow has been practicing a, a method of agriculture that is called regenerative agriculture. Uh, he, he is one of those farmers I, I, I really like to visit because you are always learning something new. And each time I've taken newer technology to him and he counters it, Pete likes to take off his hat and show me his gray hair because that he's been practicing something that he's seen results on and he cannot be convinced otherwise. A few days ago, I was calling Pete to find out from him about his wheat yields and how they are going. His answer to me was, Adrian, I've never dropped wheat yield. I am usually between 9 to 10 metric tons per hectare. And for the past three years, in his words, Pete said he has not used any fungicide in his wheat crops. This is in a period when every spe specialist in wheat breeding tells me the wheat yields have plateaued and are not going beyond seven and a half tons. This is the same period when climate change has caused so many diseases around the wheat crop that Zambia, the best of farmers three years ago, were yielding an average six metric tons. Peat, where he farms, is a very light sandy soil. His neighboring farmers who rarely get the kind of yields he does, but because of his regenerative agriculture methods, peat has incorporated so much life in his soil that his crops are growing in a resilient environment and he's having better results year on year. This morning he sent me a picture of a Johnson Sioux, and, and, and that's a technology for another time. So if we have to feed uh, the population of 2050, it's a pit and Agnes Ndililua way. The conservation agriculture, the regenerative agriculture way. So you may be asking by now, what exactly is conservation agriculture? What exactly is regenerative agriculture? Both of these methods are premised on three principles. One, minimum land disturbance. Earlier on, I told you about how the, plant, the plow goes disturbing land everywhere where we don't even need to plant our seed. Regenerative agriculture, conservation agriculture will go and only disturb the land where we need to sow. And when we leave the other parts and disturb, we preserve the homes of those workers I mentioned earlier, the ones that when we have gone to sleep, continue to work to improve our yields in, in the field. That is one principle, minimum soil disturbance. The second principle is permanent soil cover. So permanent soil cover means when we have gone into the field and harvested our crop, the other plant parts that remain, we leave it in the field and never burn it. When we leave it in the field, it decomposes and becomes the life or the food that's, that, that the microorganisms in the uh, below earth that are our friendly workers are feeding on so that they work with energy and never decide to leave. Uh, the third principle, uh, rather before I go to the third, the second principle of, of soil cover also includes in regenerative agriculture an introduction of, 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 of other diverse cover crops that brings in more uh, diversity in, in, in the food that the microorganisms will have to feed on. And so that, that second aspect leads us into the third principle, which is crop diversification. And crop diversification means that we stop monocropping maize on maize every year and monocropping wheat on wheat every year just because the market demands for it, but that we use different families of crop species in the same lands and so that the microorganisms that need to eat differently stay on in there because they know it's coming, because they know you have a plan for them. And, and they, 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 they then continue to work for you when you have taken a day off or when you take leave. 
That way, we will have had lands that are renewed every day and lands that people are not shifting away from. I usually joke with the smallholder farmers that deplete their lands with the plow and with their methods of farming. And I tell them, do you think you'll be allowed to shift and go and farm in the Ituri rainforest when you have finished all the land in Zambia? Not possible. So, so where, 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 where do we go then from here? I came to make a call to action to authorities. And I'm borrowing a classic example in driving adoption of something that works. One of the challenges, that is a reason to why there is only about 16% of people practicing, uh, of farmers practicing uh, conservation and regenerative agriculture, is the challenge of adoption and disadoption, especially for Africa. But in Zambia, we have a classical case of driving adoption. I call it the, they call it ZESCO, the Zambia Electricity Supply Corporation. Since 2011, has been running a campaign called Switch and Save. In the Switch and Save campaign, in 2011, ZESCO was giving up to six energy saving bulbs to every person that went and paid their electricity bills. And then they give you these energy saving bulbs so that you switch from the 100 watts bulb to the 20 uh, watts bulb. According to Zesco, they were able at some point to save up to three years and four months of power using that intervention. One of the reasons for this adoption is that every farmer that has bought a, a reaper today or a minimum till implement today in conservation agriculture, they went the following day to go and find a reaper shoe and found there is only a plow. Like going back to want to pick your 20 watts bulb and you find, find there is only the 100 watts bulb. So a call to action by sector players is to drive availability of minimum uh, tillage implements and to make them available for the farmers to access, to drive some punitive measures on the plow, because that if we let it cheap, and free, then we are opening lands and making our earth bleed, and it may not be able to sustain us by 2050. Second intervention is for research and developers, research and development, a focus into a diversity of seed crops and developing those. Not only focusing on what we need to eat, but focusing on developing seed systems that will feed into the cover crops that are going to reclaim the lands that are desertified by our old ways of farming. Another focus, research and development, is into crop nutrition. Fertilization, nitrogen accounts for anything between one to two thirds of what fertilizers are going into uh, the crop programs. But you will find that we have 78% of the air in the atmosphere is, is nitrogen. How, how about research and development into more solutions, climate smart solutions, of how we can harvest that and make the crops benefit from cleaner nitrogen? Focus on crop protection and farming methods around crop protection, like peat, who can grow a wheat crop of sustained yields for three years without the use of fungicides. And then finally, everyone that's involved in smart energy solutions, that we scale those up, that we pump investments into that, that we get to a place where I will have the 200 horsepower tractor that needs to draw a big planter being powered by solar. We haven't gotten there yet but the brain has got the power to get us there. And I believe that is one of the ways we will have beyond 2050 food that is uh, 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 feeding everyone. And lastly, you and me. You and me to just pick up a talk like this one and gather all manner of information and go 
to everyone that is farming and ask them to leave the plow and ask them to leave the conventional method and ask them to adopt climate smart solutions. And the reason is because when we wake up in 2050, we may need a preacher, we may need a doctor once, or we may need a teacher once. But I am sure that when we wake up in 2050, we will need a farmer three times a day, every day. Thank you.